So thank you for joining us tonight um, and joining United Policyholders on our contents intensive and webinar talking also about depreciation. Um, if, uh, if you would like to follow along to the, the slides, I believe this is on our website. If not, if you um, will check, I will make sure it's posted tonight. A little bit about United Policyholders. We're a nonprofit um, based in California. We've been doing this for 32 years. And we are, um, are we're here basically to be an information resource and voice for insurance consumers in all 50 states. And so we're funded by donations and grants. Uh, we are supported by a small professional team uh, across the country. We partner heavily with government and nonprofits. And then we have our volunteer, so our, our team team up. We have our previous catastrophic loss disaster survivors who work with us to help pay it forward. And then consumer-focused professionals such as Victoria, who's joining us today. We have our three programs. Tonight's program is under our Roadmap to Recovery. We also have our Roadmap to Preparedness, which is where we take those lessons learned after a disaster and share that information to help households and communities reduce their risk and become more resilient to disaster. And then advocacy in action where we take these pain points that people have experienced and work with regulators, legislators, and those disaster survivors to improve the consumer rights and protections moving forward. Um, if you're new to United Policyholders, just pointing out, we have our disaster insurance help libraries here at uphelp.org, recovery slash disaster recovery help. Um, just go here. You should be able to find your specific disaster. On these libraries, you're going to find state-specific resources, uh, links to professional help, samples and examples, um, our Survivor Speak series, and then information on upcoming workshops and events. Fine print, this workshop is intended to be general guidance only. We are not providing legal advice. Our speakers are volunteering their time as educators. Um, so please take that in the spirit it's intended. Um, and if you have a specific legal question, we recommend you consult an experienced policyholder attorney. Today's presenters, I am Valerie Brown, I'm United Policyholders Deputy Executive Director. With me today is Victoria White with White's Claims from Montana. Um, she is a content specialist, and so we're very fortunate to have her with us. Also, um, the man behind the mask here, uh, Ben Laterno, is our staff member and tech support for tonight's webinar. And so he'll be helping with questions in the chat. Um, want to point out um, on the um, on the bottom of your screen, uh, you will see chat will be messages from um, us, the presenters and, and the host. Um, and then you there's also a Q&A component. So if you have a question, if you ask it, we'll try to work it into the webinar or answer you directly in the Q&A. So I just want to point out those features are there for your use. So the goal of today's presentation is to help you collect that full amount your insurer owes you for every personal property item that was damaged or destroyed up to your policy limits in the least time-consuming, painless manner possible. And I know that's a heavy lift because it's a heavy job that you're doing in doing this. And so the strategy that obviously most people use is you're documenting your listing, you're valuing the items, producing your uh, available documentation to back it up. And then, you know, working with your insurer to get through this process. Guiding principles that we outline for, um, we suggest for you here, is you want to focus on documenting that full extent and value of the losses. Make sure that you're giving your adjuster, your insurance company, a chance to do the right thing, but don't be a pushover. If they make unreasonable demands, you know, politely, assertively ask, can you show me where my policy, it says that. Because if it's just a guideline, then it's subject to negotiation and you might want to push back on that. And then if you need professional help, don't hesitate to get it. This is a very painful process, we know. And just a reminder, this is not a sprint, it's a marathon for many of you. Um, you're, you've been working on this for a while and you just want to get it done. And so, you know, making sure that you're, you're pacing yourself, rewarding yourself, we'll talk a little bit about those things as well. 
Another UP aphorism is just thinking of your insurance claim as a business transaction, right? And so there's this natural transition between you and your insurance company. Obviously, they would like to minimize the amount they're paying out. You want to maximize it. Um, and so you, there's this tension here that's just because you're coming at it from different places. So again, going back to that polite assertiveness to make sure that your needs are being met. And then recognize that your adjusters are going to vary in personality and experience. Um, for many of you, you might be on your third, fourth, fifth. Some people are on their seventh, eighth, ninth adjuster. And so, you know, obviously making sure you document what it what is promised to you in writing. If they don't put it in writing, make sure that you at least capture that in an email, send it back to them um, so that you have something that says this is something we've agreed to. Another aphorism we we love to share is you know knowledge equals power. And the more you understand about your insurance benefits, your rights, and the value of your losses, the more benefits that you're going to recover, and hopefully the smoother your claim will go. So going back to what I mentioned earlier, just speaking up, present your request clearly in writing, explain what you need, when you need it, why you're entitled. I uh, keep it simple. Um, keep a working copy of your journal, excuse me, of your policy, um, put post-it notes, notes all over it. And as I said earlier, if they, if they mention something that is a requirement, ask them where it says that in your policy. Um, and then keeping that claims journal, taking notes on who you talk to, who you, the, the number, the date, the time, what was said, just keep yourself organized as much as you can. Uh, today's topics, we're going to break this into four pieces, a refresher on how the contents claims work depreciation, finishing your list, and next steps. And Victoria, at any point you want to jump in here, just feel free to um, pop in and speak as you need okay. to, okay? Perfect. Thank you. All right. So we're going to start with knowing your policy, your limits, and your insurance company. And so going back to that complete copy of your policy, having the a working copy of it, Unfortunately, you do need to read that complete policy. You're checking for anything that you might have missed earlier, endorsements that could increase the amount of your contents coverage. So you're looking for scheduled items, jewelry, artwork. You want to check your sublimits. You want to look if there's a limitation based on peril. I'll show you an example of that in a minute. And then being organized as you make purchases save those receipts. If you can, if the, the who you purchased them from will email it to you, recommend setting up a separate email so that all of those documents are there. Scan documents uh, with your phone or with a printer um, when you make purchases and just keep them at least in one place so that you have everything at your fingertips. And this is the flow of the contents coverage. Uh, that insurance funds as they're being released. So typically you're going to see an advance depending on your state. Um, it may be a mandated advance that has come across um, at, at a certain amount that they've advanced to you. Um, and then they will, um, when the values are set, they're going to provide that actual cash value payment. Um, and this is what they're saying is the, you know, that the, the depreciated value of what they owe you where they've taken off the depreciation for the age and condition of those items. And then if your policy is a replacement cost policy, they're going to provide you that difference, that re uh, replacement cost value. Once you provide proof of repairs completed, uh, uh, expenditures made. And so um, I and Christine has a great question about uh, depreciation and uh, uh, collector's items. Um, so we will get to that in a few minutes. Uh, but just reminding people, please put your questions in the Q&A. And we will get to that. So going back uh, at the beginning, just knowing your policy limits, you want to usually it's going to be uh, coverage C. Uh, State Farm, it's coverage B, so you want to know what that amount is because that is the number you're aiming to exceed in your in your inventory list. Um, I will say, it while well, putting that list together is very painful and takes a lot of effort, um, most people do have enough items that would have pushed them beyond that personal property. It's just, again, creating that list and doing the documentation and then fighting for that depreciation, the depreciation that's taken off that takes the effort here. 
And this is just another example on, in case you know, have a different policy. As I mentioned, State Farm, it is actually coverage B. So these are just examples of what it looks like. This piece, uh, just going back to the special sublimits, you know, you want to know in your policy what the what it limits you to. So money, banknotes, coins, those are usually limited. Um, I've seen policies as high as ten thousand, as low as two fifty. Um, collectibles, you know, there may be limits on your policy. You want to know. And if you look at here at F, G, H, I, and J, um, if this is that. The limitation is the peril. It's by theft. So the peril is lost by theft, which would mean these firearms are not limited in your policy due to a wildfire. Does that make sense? And so you want to, that's again, why you're going back to read your policy and making sure you understand exactly what it says. And when you have questions, ask your agent, excuse me, your adjuster, not your agent. Uh, just flagging some items that are not usually covered. So items that are insured elsewhere, jewelry, scheduled art, things like that, they're not going to be covered. Your animals are not covered. If you had roommates or subtenants in the house, they are their items are not covered. Um, most motor vehicles and recreational vehicles are not covered unless it's uh, you've scheduled them in your policy. Uh, we've already talked about the uh, replacement costs, RCV, actual cost value. Depreciation is also sometimes known as holdback, uh, but just wanted to make sure everybody understands these terms. Uh, here's the definition of it. Um, and so, in, and this is important, um, understanding it's what it would actually cost to repair or replace. And so, Victoria, do you mind just touching you know, when you're doing an, uh, an inventory, helping someone with pricing, um, you're providing that snapshot of what it would cost to replace that item at that time, right? I'm so sorry. Can you repeat just the <laughs> end? I'm so sorry. No, 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 <laughs> you're fine. End of that you're question. Fine. You're fine. Uh, so full disclosure, um, I have noisy dogs in the background. Victoria has noisy toddlers. So um, we're just uh, going to keep this moving along. Um, so, Victoria, the, the question was, when we're talking about that pricing for that what it, uh, replacement cost, when you're preparing an inventory, um, if you were working on the inventory, say, six months before, uh, you're, you're pulling pricing as it is at that time. So, you know, you're submitting that to the insurance company, but when you actually replace it, it might cost more than what you put into the inventory, correct? I just wanted right. you to explain that process a little bit, what that okay. looks like on your end. Sure. Um, so for me, when I do an inventory list, what I do is I obviously list the item. And so for ease, say, let's say it's a Samsung TV. When I do my pricing lists, I include a link of where I found that item so that I have found that when the insurance company is going through it, if they have a question about that price or they're like, eh, I don't really know. Literally they can click on that link and see where I found that price on the back end of that. When they go, you know, to pay you out and they've paid you $200 for that TV and today to replace that TV, whatever that looks like could be $500. What you can do is submit the receipt for what you have purchased and as long as you have contents money still available, you can submit that receipt and generally they will pay the difference between what they paid you and what you paid for it the day you bought it. That is not every insurance company, but generally what I've seen, that is the way that that works. So, you know, always saving those receipts for when you actually purchase the item is always very smart because then you can, you know, when you actually rebuy those items, if you have 10 large items, it could be, you know, upwards of a thousand thousands of dollars. So I always suggest that people submit them that way after the fact and say, this is what I paid for this today. And this is what you paid me. Can I recoup the difference? Right. And, and that I just, uh, Marked one of the questions in the Q and A is is being answered live precisely for that reason. 
um, when you're preparing the inventory, all you can do is provide the pricing as of that moment of what it would cost to replace. By the time right. you actually get to replacing it, it could look very different. Right. All right, let me touch our other definitions here, actual cash value. So it's that pre-loss value of the item. And the way uh, the way to look at it is if you were willing to sell it to someone who was willing to buy it right before the loss, what would that be? Um, now, if you had a manufactured home, most of those policies are limiting uh, contents to actual cash value. So you wanna be, again, very aware of what's in your policy. Um, and this is the formula that we see for um, depreciation and actual cash value, right? So what they're going to pay you is that replacement cost minus the depreciation to get the actual cash value. Remember, that's that first amount that you get after the advance. Um, and then again, you're looking at your um, the specific language, right? So they're paying the ACV. Um, and then most policies are going to have this language that say exactly what they're doing. And so for the, there was one question in the Q&A about um, Paula's question, uh, if if item was lost in 2019, but not paid until 2023, um, if it exceeds, if you're, if, and Paula, I'm assuming you're talking about your total amount of your policy uh, of your your inventory and those items it exceeds your policy limits, what happens? Um, they should, as Victoria said, pay you up to policy limits. Exceeding policy limits, you would have to, that's a different issue. You're looking at a legal issue there. And so um, that would not, that would be something to um, take to an attorney if you're trying to exceed your policy limits. And let me keep us going here. Sorry. Um, and this is just a, a visualization of what we're talking about. So the, the easiest example is to have a uh, have for a couch. So you've got the cost to buy that new couch, right? So you, you've lost your couch. Here's the cost to buy the new couch. Here's here's the um, uh, how much they're deducting. Oh, sorry. Uh, if you're looking at your couch and it's five years old and um uh, not very worn, so roughly half the value. They're going to deduct that, and this is basically the actual cash value depreciation here. These two things are going to equal that whole. And before we get on documenting, Selena, thank you so much. So Selena has put a comment um, in the in the Q and A um, uh, that on ATVs, golf carts, etc most carriers will cover if it was used to service the property. So it has to be um, something that would be used there. And, and Selena, if you, anything else you want to add, please, please share. Uh, Selena's a, a UP staffer who popped on tonight and we're very grateful that she's here. So we're looking at the documenting now. Sorry, let me go back. Um, so for this part, Victoria, you know, when you're documenting, this is our guidance that we give. And so, I, you know, it's like if they're asking for that detailed inventory, you know, you're gathering everything you've got, right. uh, receipts that you can collect from your bank um, that might be available online or with that sh uh, that that business, any photos that you have from family and friends or on your mm -hmm. phone that you can substantiate what you had, all of those records that you have, because you're trying to build that as complete and accurate a list as possible. Um, are there any other tricks you would suggest people do in adding to building that list? I mean, those are all the best case scenario, right? You have receipts or photos or anything like that. Honestly, the, the main thing that I suggest to people I work with is doing a memory jogger because a memory jogger, while you may not have something tangible to like look at or or whatnot uh, most people like remember what their things are like they know that it was a KitchenAid mixer or they know that it was a shark vacuum and that is equally as important as having maybe the actual receipt because you're giving them enough information that they're not really looking you know to question 
every single item or whatnot. So a memory jogger for me is something I always, always suggest to people because not only are they super helpful in thinking about the things you don't think about, um, it, it just helps you also, you know, list specifically the items you do remember, you know, whether it be a, a, the sofa brand or like a whirlpool washing machine or whatnot. Um, for me on my end, those things help guide me in a price. Um, and then also, you know, the same for the insurance company. So the memory jogger would be my, my, is always my go-to. All right. Thank you for that. And then, um, so, oh, sorry about that. I'm, I'm hitting the wrong things here. Um, with the, um, once you submit your inventory, you know, you're going to trust, but verify their adjust the, what they, their valuation of your contents. Right. Um, we're going to talk about that when we talk about depreciate depreciation a little bit more. So just want to point out for those of you who have been busy with other pieces of your claim and you're stalled a little bit on inventory. So if you go to our website, we do have sample files and examples. Um, everybody who attends today will send you a, a follow-up email that has some uh, we have an intern put together some hot linked tabs of common items that would be in a kitchen, bathroom, office, bedroom, that kind of stuff, just to give you real time pricing that gives you something to work from as you're going. All right, I'm going to take a deep breath. Okay, and now we're the fun part of depreciation. And Selena, if you are game, I was going to promote you up to a panelist if you're here. So if you see that, um, you should be able to pop up. So depreciation. So that's the loss in value of an item due to age and condition. So wear and tear, right? These are other terms you may see. And the thing to bear in mind is this is negotiable. So I know we had a question. Um, uh, let me start with some of the questions we had in the Q&A here. And Victoria and Selena, please feel free to pop in for any of these. So Christine said she had many Apple IIe discs. These are games that are collector's items. State Farm has depreciated them greatly. Shouldn't they be reimbursed at the current rate? Also had a huge sass of yarn. Um, and again, depreciated greatly. And it was like new, unused, well cared for yarn. So um, can both of you weigh in on that, please? Um, this is Victoria. My suggestion would be, um, like I said, for example, when I work on a claim, I always include um, the link to where I found it. So if she was able to show where she purchased this and let them know that this was a, a new item, generally that would be enough to let them know obviously what the cost of it would could be or is it doesn't necessarily mean that they will give you that full cost but if you were to repurchase it you could recoup that difference in 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 that way I, it really is hard to say because each insurance company is different i've had insurance companies say that you know okay, if you can show me where that price is, you know, on a website or, or whatnot, just give me something that shows that actual price. And if it was new, they have paid that way. And I've had others say, no, unfortunately it is five years old. Even if it was new, this is the price we can offer you. If you replace it, you know, then we look at it that way. So right. it's and kind of hard. <laughs> No, and that, that feeds into the second bullet, right? There is no official standard for how much they can depreciate your property. But something like that, unused yarn um, in like new condition, definitely challenge those numbers. They are, they are unfair. Um, another thing to point out is just be aware of items that should not be depreciated. Selena, anything to add on, on that scenario? 
Yes, thank you, Val. So a lot of, well, and I can only speak uh, for one insurance company, and that's State Farm, which they can depreciate items up to 80%. That's the most that they can take. Now, we've got to, I mean, you have to be very, very strategic when you're creating these lists because, and think about like that yarn, she's never used it. So that would be something that maybe in a narrative that people need to also write when they send in their contents list because you want to answer all the questions before your carrier asks or before they just automatically mark some of these items as need more info because as we know if they do it as a um if they turn it in on that what they call a ppcw which is that personal property contents worksheet if you're turning it in like that and letting your carrier take over from there and then they import it into that contents collaboration the policyholders are not able to send in links that will import but what they can do and what i would highly suggest is take a snippet or a screenshot if you find your they had a dining room table and it was um five thousand dollars take a snag it or a, a screenshot of that and that's going to be what you want to send in as a pdf for items like that um that i would highly suggest that um and then you want to argue you can argue with them on like the christmas items and vases and clocks things of that nature that you don't there's no wear tear deterioration to that it doesn't really um it shouldn't be depreciated more than 10 or 20 percent because christmas items we get it out once a year and maybe it's out for 30 maybe for some others it might be out 90 days but it's still things that should not be depreciated heavily which is typically 80 percent when we've had our christmas items for say what 20 plus years does that make sense yeah, no, thank you. And I and I and thank you both for for sharing. And Selena, thank you for being game just to pop up. Selena Clark is another United Policyholders uh staff member and and very excited to have her join us today. Um so so Thanks. just you know being aware so with with what Victoria's suggesting having that list with those links so that you've got that proof if there's a question, you know where you got that pricing is key and then taking Selena's advice of to doing that screenshot, that PDF, so that you've got backup, especially for those high ticket dollar items that uh, high value dollar, high, sorry, high dollar valued items. There we go. Um, that uh, that are, you know, you, you don't want question. You want them to be very clear. Um, and then you can always, I, I've not seen a lot of people successful on this, but you can ask them to give you the depreciation schedule, the method they're using. So you understand. So definitely worth the attempt. Um, but, you know, being again, knowing what's in your policy, most policies allow them to depreciate property to reflect the condition. Um, and both California and Colorado, they are looking at age and condition of the property. Um, you know, and, and it's knowing what the useful life uh, is of that property. Um, and, and, and you, what, one of the red flags for you when you're looking at that is if everything comes back depreciated 50, 80%, they did not look at the age and condition of those items. So, you know, things to be aware of if, if you're challenging. And this is why depreciation matters. So if your list is heavily depreciated, they're forcing you to buy all those replacement items. And the reality for most people is you're you're going to buy things when and if you need them. And, um, you know, for example, I have three teenage, excuse me, now adult daughters, but that's 12 prom dresses. I don't need prom dresses right now, right? Not going to spend money on that. But those were like new dresses that are in my home. So, um, you know, that type of thing, you know, being aware of how you manage it. And um, so just be aware that you you're for a lot of them you are going to have to submit um 
uh, reimbursements. But again, that's where you're arguing back on uh, the valuation. And uh, Victoria, you answered Lynn. I see he's in there twice, right? You handled that? I did not. Okay. All right. I will, I will bring him up in just a minute. So okay. um, let's go. All right. So here's an example of the list submitted, the information come back, ignore the numbers and the pricing, but you know, this is where they were putting how many, you know, this is what the list looks like, right? Here's the items, um, you know, how old the items were or what condition they were in, you know, uh, what that cost would be to replace it, you know, the details that you've got, anything you've got. And then what you get back is uh, something like this. This is a Liberty Mutual example that shows you what they have valued it at, how much they're subtracting for depreciation. And all of these numbers here are going to end up totaling the amount of that check for the actual cash value. So just wanted you to see it in process, right? Really? Really quick before you, could you pop back to that screen for me? This is a perfect example of why I work with people to not let the insurance companies price their items. Because if you look at the unit price on that Liberty Mutual list, generally what happens, so this on that first line, they had a total of seven shirts and every shirt was listed as $11. The amount of money that can be lost in that is because I know for me, every shirt I buy is not the same exact price. So break being able to, to price your items out yourself, at least you could say, okay, I'm, I have two shirts at 11 and I have two shirts at 27 and I have two shirts at 35. You have just increased your your um, replacement value or your replacement cost value by half. And so those are really important things to watch because most people, when they look at this, are looking at that actual cash value line and don't really look at, they just priced every 40 pairs of shoes I have at $27. No matter, it, it doesn't matter. And so this is that that unit price is a really, really important thing to look at when you're looking to either bump to to get your your contents limit to the max or at least be able to say, no, every shirt I have is not eleven dollars. Right. Um, that's so that's a good point. Yeah. Especially when you uh, look at these, like the uh, the women's sweater, twenty two dollars. No way in the world you're right. Gonna, yeah, and and right. so and and we'll talk about you know pricing a little bit more later. But just the okay. idea of sorry, <laughs> no, 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 no. But this is this is actually perfect with this example. I just wanted to 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 call out the, you know, when you're making your list, maybe you chunk it. You had if you had 20 sweaters and you bought five at Chico's, five, you know, you know, you right. know exactly where you shopped. And, and you're just doing a, what's the average uh, uh, price of, you know, full, full cost price of those sweaters. What's the average. Right. And you can make it simple on yourself, right. but making it reflect your reality. Right. Um, exactly. And so uh, Victoria and Selena. Can I, have, can I yeah. Yeah. Go right ahead, Selena. Yeah. Can I piggyback on that? Mm -hmm. Now it is so important for people to like, when you were saying like, you had 20 sweaters okay do yourself a favor and don't list all 20 sweaters on one line because you didn't buy all 20 of those say 20 years ago exactly. maybe you bought five of them okay because that is going to determine the depreciation okay so don't list them 20 at 20 years old do yourself a favor, break them up. It's going to be, yes. you know, two or three more line items, but please do yourself a favor and list Agreed. out the, um, yeah, right, Victoria? Yes, yes. And That's also, so important because that also depends on what percentage they depreciate because obviously something 20 years old is going to depreciate more than something that's a year old. Mm -hmm, exactly. And then something else that you might want to keep in mind is like you were talking about the prom dresses, Val. Okay. You're not yeah. going to replace prom dresses. 
What you are going to go buy is other clothing items. And you can talk to the adjuster and see if they would be willing to swap some of those items. It's like, okay, say you're not going to replace six prom dresses, but I am going to go out and I'm going to buy a nice winter coat and I'm going to buy, you know, maybe something else that you didn't have and ask them. It's like, okay, can I swap clothing for clothing? Can I swap furniture for furniture? As long as you're staying in the same lane, that should not be a problem because you and I both know everybody is not going to replace the same thing typically that they have on their list. Maybe exactly. some of the items, but not all. Right, right. And that actually gets into two questions in the Q&A. So Jerome asks, how would you deal with the fact their original item might not even be on the market anymore? They had an old uh, an old washing machine, 20 gallon uh, top loader, replaced it with a high efficiency washer because they couldn't even find the style they had in the appliance mm -hmm. store. And and so that's, Selena, that's where you're talking about staying in the lane, right? But the the value they're owed is that it might have been an older, more expensive one right. placing that. What I generally do in that situation is I work with the client and say, okay, like let's, it probably, you'll find it somewhere like eBay or Etsy or on some sort of, you know, all alternative website, but I will generally look and try to find a like item as close as I can and within the price range that the client is comfortable with, because if they say, okay, that maybe it's, you know, 30 years old, I can't remember how old they said it was, but say it's 30 years old and they can't, you, obviously you can't f buy that today. You're just not going to find it, but eBay could potentially get you to a number that you're comfortable with saying, this is roughly what I paid or what it's worth today or whatnot. And then it could, it could raise the question and they could say, where did you find this? And, and you just, for me, for example, like I said, with my parents had a total loss when the adjuster would ask me and they say, well, where did you get this number? Or where is this? And I said, that was the closest like item that I could find. And they generally, he, he did not have a problem with that. Like I said, that's, a blanket statement because every insurance is different and every adjuster is different, but I say, put it out there for what you, what you believe it is or what you have found to be the closest like item. So that would be my suggestion for that. Right. And that fits in. Actually, you guys just answered Christine's question, the dishes she lost no longer available, but uh, no longer made, but available through like replacements.com on another website and they should reimburse at that replacement cost. Uh, and that's the value you're setting for that unit price as well. All right, let me keep us going here, sorry. Um, uh, this is just another example. Um, and this is showing you how they're, you're getting paid, right? And so we've already talked about this. It's just, a, it breaks it down into um, a pretty simple piece. Um, and then I, I know there was a comment in the uh, in the in the questions uh, in the Q and A that uh, was brought up about excessive depreciation. Um, so I wanted to just uh, bring up the point that um, I believe it was Christine had made um, that um, when you're when you're getting this getting your list back when you submit it and you're getting it back. Christine noted that State Farm changed the condition of her items to average. So you're looking at depreciation, you're looking at the condition, you're looking at that unit price they may have assigned, um, because these are these are corrections when you get the list back that you're going to ask them to make. Right? All of Christine's items were not average. Um, you know, everything is not a blanket, seventy five percent depreciated. Uh, so, you know, being aware of that. And then as, as uh, Victoria and Selena said, you know, breaking out your list so that you're capturing the the tiers of quality and, and where those items might've been purchased. So flagging that, because uh, you really do want to negotiate this on a case by case basis. I will say we had a question in the chat about, do you have to do each item? And I'm going to say it depends. Um, some some 
agents, excuse me, some adjusters are going to allow you to aggregate items, um, you know, uh, say I had this many books and and you mutually agree to a cost per book and, and they're going to pay you out the thousand books and you, you don't have to replace all. So being aware of that, we do have an example of a depreciation guide um, that you can um, look at. So this is how you find it. Um, just to, so you get an idea of what it looks like before you submit. In California specifically, you do have some protection. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it needs to reflect the condition and age, and it should apply only to properly normally, property normally subject to repair or replacement. So remember, some items do not depreciate. Uh, Victoria Selena, I know it's um, uh, jewelry typically appreciates, musical instruments, um, artwork generally, unless you are the artist, because that's a different issue. Anything else that you would add to that list that would not de be depreciated? I would have to say Legos, especially if they are discontinued. We just did a right. big list for for kids with Legos. It's unbelievable how much those things cost. Right. All right, and then let me let me hit the. Uh, oh, here we go. So we've got. Uh, actually, let me go back here before we take that deep breath because I do have a. Um, Nope, we answered it. Never mind. Let me keep this going. So um, that's been answered. Deep breath. I'm going to be quiet for a minute. So, and and the questions that we have still pending for those of you hanging on, waiting to get your question answered, we're going to hit them here when we're talking about finishing your list. Um, so when you're adding to your list, you know, again, adding, asking family, friends, neighbors to review, add items they recall, using your bank stores you shop frequently um, any you'll be surprised where you can find so the the lady who mentioned the yarn um, if you know the two or three yarn stores that you frequented and that you had a, a frequent shoppers card that they track to give you a discount most likely they're tracking your either they're going to track your purchases or they're going to have a really good idea of what you would have bought and they can provide you um, with, you know, this is the type of stuff you have. And sometimes because they want your business, they'll provide that list of here's what it would cost to restock you from my shop with what you typically had. Um, stores that allow you to do the gift registry, you can certainly do it online. Um, and, and just a caution, you'll be surprised how many of something you had. Uh, my, I did a, a coworker a challenge with our coworkers and we were like, how many dress shirts are hanging in your closet? This is specifically at, um, men in the house. And the guess was they had, you know, cause it's, I, you know, visually you're like, I see the same five shirts. Well, they had 25 shirts. So it was, it was surprising how many things were just a one-off use in very good condition. So being aware of that. Uh, these are the resources on our website to help you with that. Like I said, if you use any of our spreadsheets, please, please take the time to make it reflect what you had. Uh, this is just a, uh, as, as Victoria said, this is just a memory jogger that can get you started. But um, you, what you don't want to do is um, grab something. And I, I know this is on one of the lists we have. Uh, grandma Nell's uh, quilt and you don't have a grandma Nell because that gets into uh, Lynn's question about the uh, that lifestyle question um, you know if you're if if they look at it and things don't they want to if they want to ask you questions about your family and your purchases obviously you're going to cooperate but you know you just want to be aware that you what you're submitting is what you had not you know, not slipping there and and submitting something that that is not yours. Um, this is a little bit on quantities. Um, so just the strategy of um, you know how many are in a in a foot of space, how many feet of bookcases you had. Um, I will say the average American woman having a hundred and three articles of clothing did they did not meet my daughter's. Um, so, um, just, you know, being aware of how much you might've had. 
um, because the reality for most of us is that we only use a fraction of what we have on a on a re recurring basis. And there are things that we pull out for those uh, special one times things. So there's a lot of stuff there. Uh, craft and art supplies are easy to underestimate. Um, that yarn is, I mean, you can pack so much yarn into one square foot of space. So, you know, uh, taking advantage of opportunities to uh, take, you know, at your neighbor's house, at the yarn store, at the bookstore, and just measure and see what that actually looks like for you. And then protecting yourself, again, never intentionally claim items you did not have. Um, uh, inflate the value, the quality, the quantity. It needs to reflect to the best of your ability what you remember. Even a lot of people feel like... Um, if it's going to be depreciated heavily and they have that fear, they 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 want to consider that, don't. It needs to reflect the reality of what you had because you do not want to intentionally misrepresent what you had. Having said that, innocent mistakes are very common. You're doing this from memory. That does not mean you've committed fraud, okay? Um, it's just you're doing the best you can with what you have. And a lot of times, um, people remember more as you go. It's just it's just as as you get more bandwidth in your brain, you're going to remember more things. Um, so be aware of that. Pricing matters. And so I want to hit Paula's question here, um, making sure the pricing reflects what it would cost to replace. Normally, you're not using sale prices. Um, if you had China, um, it's available on replacements.com. Um, Paula's question is, could she, you know, she's submitting what she had, but Selena, going back to your, you know, that bucket of if she chooses to replace her China that's not available anymore, except through some source like that, because it's not made, could she choose to replace it with uh, something comparable that is new instead? Sure, that the China would fall under... Um, housewares, dining, fine china. So anything along that line in the same lane again and check with the adjuster just to make sure that they'd be willing to swap that out. That should not be a problem at all. Got it. Um, and then, you know, making sure you use pricing that reflects the quality of items you had. And this is where you're, when you submit this, you're making sure we, you're checking that inventory list when it comes back from your insurer, looking at that unit price, like Victoria mentioned. Uh, if you had a Waterford bowl, you don't want a Walmart Pyrex bowl coming back. And I've seen that happen in other people's inventory. So be aware that that's part of that QC that you're doing. Uh, these are some resources to help with pricing. Uh, we'll we'll um, we'll get some more uh, resources from uh, Victoria and Selena in a minute. But I do want to answer the question from our anonymous uh, attendee. Um, it's do we have to provide actual cost for repairs if they're below the ACV? So, for example, replacing window coverings was cheaper than ACV. So the, obviously, there's no possibility of recovering the replacement costs. Um, and so, uh, do, do they need to supply the receipts? Can the insurance company demand to see the receipts? Can they decrease the amount they pay for ACV? Um, or could she just say it's been covered? I don't need the RCV. There Lots of questions no there. need to send that receipt in. <laughs> well, yeah. They, do they have yeah, to? There... Yeah. If they're not going beyond, not not claiming RCV, they shouldn't have to submit the receipts, right? Unless the carrier requested it, right? That would be what I have seen and understand is that generally the only time you would need to submit that if it's above and beyond what your ACV was. So. Um, Got it. Um, so, yeah. All right. And then, so for uh, other option, other resources to help with pricing, because I know this is what trips people up, um, especially for higher value items. And so I'm going to kind of go into this. I, I know someone had asked a question about 
family artists. So my understanding is that if you were the artist, you were, or some, a member of your family who was covered by your, your contents inventory, uh, if you were the artist, they just owe you for materials, right? Um, whereas if, if the, this is artists outside of your household, they, um, they owe you for whatever that, that um, hopefully appreciated value is, right? This is a slippery slope for me because I have, I guess my suggestion has always been that to, if you're able to say it was an aunt that, that painted this for you and, and she is still living that you can ask what would be a price that you would give this. And I know that sounds weird, but then you, you kind of, you consider supplies and, and this and that. And I always suggest people put that number in. If you're unable to ask that family member, I again would maybe look at a like items. If it's a, you know, a Paris street painting or something like that, like find something that you feel is comparable and put that number in. If your adjuster comes back and says, where did you get that number? just be honest and say, I found a comparable item that I was comfortable with. And that is, that's the number I have. Like, you know, and like I said, again, it all depends on the adjuster. I've had people come back and say, my, my adjuster had no problem with that. And I've had adjusters, you know, go the other way. So that's always my suggestion. Um, so I don't know that that's the best suggestion, <laughs> but it's it's generally the one that I give because no one's able, you know, no one's able unless they're a, a famous artist, family right. member is able to really give that a number. So, you know, you can always ask your adjuster to, you know, you guys, like you said, have that discussion and negotiation and get to a, something that you're comfortable with. But I would always just say kind of give it a number and and see what happens. Right. And, 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 and that, that makes sense. Something that you can stand behind. Um, exactly. And exactly. if you're lucky and your aunt has sold artwork, she can say, yeah, you had a 12 by 18 uh, watercolor. I've been selling them for this. Exactly. You know, as long as it's defensible. And so when we're talking about pricing valuable collections, uh, you know, these are the things that you're looking for um, in this space, but there's, you know, there's a whole lot of variation here. And I know uh, this is an area people stumble because uh, I have a friend who lost his, um, you know, a, 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 a turn of the 1800, early 1800s violin. I can't pronounce the name of the, it starts with an S. So somebody might catch me and say it. Um but it it was it was incredibly valuable, and State Farm gave him pennies on the 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 thousands of dollars on it. Um, and the argument was, you know, it was kind of getting into that lifestyle thing of, you know, can you? Ha, ha, we're not sure you had that, and it it basically is something he inherited from his his family. So it was his. He he had some proof, but nothing substantial, and so. I, this is an area I know people struggle. How do you do it? Besides the only resource that we've listed is a IRS qualified appraiser. Are there other options out there to help people with these valuable things like that, that, that can help with proving um, what that might be valued at? Yeah, as far as the value, Val, um, I don't know of anything but what I do know is that the State Farm will ask for proof of these things sometimes. And it's like, well, how do we, and, and they're actually, you know, and unfortunately it's like they're calling a policyholder a liar because it's like, okay, well, did you really have this? What I found is you can actually have a neighbor, a friend, a family member, if they would be willing to sign a, um, I'll call it a proof of loss for something, um, you know, just saying that, yes, 
I saw this in their house. It was hanging in the hallway. It was hanging in the living room. And sign it and send it in to State Farm or that carrier. That way you have some type of proof um, because obviously people don't go around taking pictures of their artwork and different things in their house. Um, but after they have had a, a total loss like this, my hope and prayer is that people will be diligent in either taking a video of things or, you know, just take pictures, please just take pictures. So you can justify that. Yes, I did have this. You can prove it when asked if needed. Got it. Thank you. And Victoria, anything, um, to help in this space because it is I know it's such a, it's a space people struggle in not just um, art, but jewelry and things like that how how right. do, do you substantiate I am um, the asking the neighbor comment was I've actually never heard that but it's great I mean that's you know not something I've really ever thought of but you know if you can have someone if they're questioning you and you can have someone confirm that yes they saw it in your home like that's, I mean, that's great. <laughs> but um, as far as like, I personally try to just work closely with my clients in this situation where sometimes they'll send me a link and they'll say, this is almost identical to what I had, or this is, you know, this is around the price range. I, I generally, like I said, I usually will have people, if they cannot get a spot on like 100% number or whatnot, but even that fluctuates. If you have a number two and the picture, the link you're looking at is a number 27, you know, that could change greatly. Um, so I just, like I said, I would suggest just having as much documentation of, as you can, even if it's it's not an I, identical, it's as close as you can to any of the items, you know, and then just give as much information as you can. Most people don't want to spend a lot of time making things up on the type of work or the, you know, they're they're just trying to get through it and and move on from this portion. So I found that, like I said, generally the adjusters don't fight back much when you kind of stand firm on this is what I had. I know what was in my home, you know? And so I, I don't know that one's, <laughs> that one's kind of hard for me. It's, it's hard. I've seen people be very successful and I've seen people stymied and exactly. And so I know it's a, I know it's a, it's a, it's a hot point, hot issue. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let me keep us moving here. Um, we've already talked about this, so um, uh, keep going, be organized. Um, yeah, these are suggestions for doing, um, all, you know, to help you stay organized. You want to be strategic. Um, and, and this gets back into uh, what Victoria and Selene have said. We, you know, you're, you're not unlikely to replace everything you've lost. Um, so you want to maximize those ACV payments by arguing for lower depreciation, especially on your big ticket items, identifying, like Victoria said, that true replacement cost um, at standard, not just to count retailers. You want to make sure it reflects exactly what you had. Um, and just, you know, being being strategic as you move forward, right? All right, deep breath. Next steps after, so you've, uh, let's go with, you've submitted it. So you want to trust, but verify again, remembering condition matters as much as age. You're going to negotiate depreciation. You know, I know this is a repeat, but this, this is that next piece, right? Um, and, and this goes back to our yarn example from earlier, right? Even if it's 20 years old, it might've been in like new condition. And so, you you know, you can argue that it should be based on the depreciation should be based on the remaining life expectancy, not the actual age, right? Because that condition was like you just bought it. Uh, here's our favorite example of age and condition. So uh, five-year-old couch, 
no children, no dogs, no cats, <laughs> you know, maybe you'd appreciate it 20, 20%, right? My couch with kids and pets and 85 pound dogs, 80%. It's just not that in that good a shape. But what that means is simply when um, I get my ACV check back, if I'm household A here on the left, um, they should have only depreciated 20%. So that eight that that $1,000 couch we talked about earlier, they should be giving me an ACV check for 800. This, uh, unfortunately, my household, we're getting a check for $200. Same. For ACV. <laughs> yes. And that's okay. Because when we buy that couch, if it costs a thousand, then we're going to get that difference. If it costs exactly. more, we should get that difference um, up, you know, up to the item replace. If we replace that couch with a discount couch that costs nine hundred dollars, you know, we're leaving money on the table, and and sometimes that's okay because you want what you want, but you know, do be aware of that. Can I, um, Victoria? Question for you. Um, one of the issues I've found a lot of people have pop up our beds. Um, you know, they had a king lost it they're you know when they're rebuilding their house they're they're like i don't want to need a king again i don't have you know uh, kids doing a pile on the bed and animals it's it's a different right. situation yeah they owe you for the king mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but conversely if you had a queen and want to go to the king they owe you for the queen right unless you yes negotiate yes. it yes sorry yeah Yes. So yeah, if you had a king bed and now you're like, I'm moving into a small, my house will be smaller or wherever I'm going into. And then you buy a queen. It's essentially going to swap the bed for the bed. Now, even if say they only pay you 500 for the king you had, but you replaced it with the queen and that queen now, because mattresses are oddly expensive. Now you're paying a thousand dollars even though the size is different, you would still want to submit for that price difference because um, yeah. like she said before, you're just wanting to stay in that lane because you had a coffee table before doesn't mean you can't purchase a sofa, sofa table next. Like just keep those items generally in their lane. That's, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then this is just that explanation again of, uh, you know, have the replacement policy. Why are they only paying you? Uh, this is just recapping that because I know this is confusing for people when you submit the, especially when you do your inventory, you've got the pricing. It's like, why am I not getting paid? But that's that clause in your policy that says, you know, you, it's, you're, they're not, they don't owe you until you incur that expense. Right. And that's a good thing to point out because that was something that I learned. <laughs> when my parents did that and I was like, wait, 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 and came in all hot and crazy and they explained it to me. And then I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> and right. you know, when they replaced those items, they did recoup that money. So, um, that's a really important slide to remember. Right. And this is examples of that loss, uh, loss settlement language. Um, and, and just, um, this is another example um, so before we get on the time limits, just to throw out, um, I, one of the mistakes I've seen people make is they have the policy limit, right? They know what they're owed for their contents. And when they do their pricing for their inventory, they basically stop when they hit that number. And the reality, as you both have explained, is that they're going to depreciate it. You're going to have actual cash value payment on most items. Um, and, the re and you probably aren't going to replace every item. So um, stopping your inventory at the point of, you know, from your calculation, uh, your replacement costs are going to hit that isn't going to get you a check for the full amount, correct? Correct. What I found was you need to be at least, at least 40% over <laughs> your policy limit because that's about an average out of all. All the claims that I'd handled, 40% was a decent average of, well, it's not a decent, it's not decent for the policyholder, but that is what um, State Farm typically holds out on an average. Right. Does depending, that make sense? Depending on the wear and tear of your items, my house with uh, two monster dogs and, and three kids, 
Um, obviously, I, I'm going to be have more heavily depreciated than someone who's a, a single in their home with items very precise. So um, knowing your your family situation will help you in, in determining what that might look like. And again, when you get that list, you're arguing for all of those things we talked about before so that it reflects accurately what they what they should owe you. So I want to touch really briefly, time limit to collect replacement cost benefits in California. Um, you have a, a time limit, you have 36 months from the date the first payment towards the ACV is made. That's not the advance, it's the ACV. Um, and so that's California law. For Colorado, um, it is uh, 30, 365 days after the total loss claim to submit. Um, that's to submit. And then to um, for depreciation, Colorado law has um, beyond wear and tear market value. So it's, it's a holistic approach. Um, and then depreciation for California is defined here. I'm not going to read these. These slides will be available on the website, but do want to talk that, uh, make sure you understand that while depreciation is not standardized and there's a no official definition of it for these two states, there are regulations that outline and talk about what depreciation should look like that hopefully protects you as a policyholder. I'm going to wrap really fast here um, through the slides. We'll stop sharing my screen and then see if we don't have any more questions. I'll just ask uh, Victoria and Celine if there's anything they'd like to add, any tips and tricks that you want to share. Uh, so reminder, um, if you want to connect to other disaster survivors, we have our Survivor to Survivor forums, great source of information. Uh, if you've got a specific question, our Ask an Expert forum is available for you. Just register. It's free. Write in your question and we'll get an answer to you. Uh, if you have an insurance issue in the state of California, the Department of Insurance is a resource for you to get help with your um, pers uh, free personal assistance with your claims. Cal uh, Colorado is the D DORA under the Division of Insurance. Um, so this is the information for them. Uh, thanks to our funders, RCRC, Golden State, and Boulder Community Foundation. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I see that we have one more question in the Q&A. Ooh, Georgianne. So let's get Georgianne. Uh, she has some Gibson expensive guitars. Uh, and the exact to make quote described uh, is $89. Uh, knew they would have cost $250 to replace at least. And so they were very old, which should have made them more valuable. Victoria, how would you mm. have tackled that one? <laughs> I think I just want to ask really quick about, I'm not sure what that exact to make quote document is. Uh, I generally don't see anything on the insurance side. Um, so is that something that's provided from the insurance? It's it's probably um, exactly. It's usually used for the dwelling, but it it, it could have been. Um, my guess would be they bundled in. So usually okay. it's a it's it's just let's just say it's the 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 document okay. that the insurance company provided. We'll ignore that. So I would assume that this kind of falls into that shirt thing we talked about earlier, where it's seven shirts at eleven dollars. They generally, when they price the items, they don't necessarily put in the information, right? They're not putting in Gibson guitar, acoustic or electric, you know, like that information. So they're giving you a very basic bottom line number. My suggestion in this situation would be to look up the guitars that you had. Um, and if you can find, again, a similar item, something that's very close and put those links into an email to them and say, I see that you have listed my guitars for $89 each. Below are the links for the closest or the exact or however they want to word it to the guitars I had. Please see prices attached and let them do the work for it. Like let them, you know, kind of fight them on that number because that's a huge number. That's not like $89 and a hundred dollars. That's, and so you, and it's, it's hard because it's just another thing that the, you know, 
that you have to do to get that money. But I think it's very important to, if you can take the time to give them the information they need to give you an accurate number. Um, so that would be my suggestion in that situation is look for similar or exact item, put it in an email with the link if you can, and say, this is exactly where I found this guitar at this price. And these are the prices I would like reflected in my list or my payout or whatnot. Right. Selena, anything to add to that? Yes, I love the idea of the links. However, the only problem is when you put a link inside an email and you send it to your claim, it becomes embedded into that document. So it's coming through into the claim as a PDF. So for adjusters who are handling 50, 60 total loss claims, they're not going to take time to, and most generally, I found that you could not copy and paste from that PDF that came into the claim. So that's why I always liked the screenshots. I was as just well. going to say a screenshot. Yeah. Is the same. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And it's easier for an adjuster to deal with the screenshot because then they can include that when they send it up for authority. Um, to all the different layers of management has, that has to bless that for them to make a payment. Um, something else that you were talking about where you can find pricing. So besides the ones um, that I've seen on the screen, there's Cherish, there it, you're not going to believe this, but as I've been searching for pricing on some things, just type it into the, type it into Google, whatever you're looking for, and then it's going to come up with all these different places where you can find it, whether it's REI or Cabela's right. or pick the most expensive one. Okay. Because they all vary <laughs> That's what in I price. Do. <laughs> so if it, yeah, if it's $99 at REI, but Cabela's has the same thing and it's $129, use $129 and do right. yourself a favor. Okay? And I think because Valerie said it. it anyway. Right. Sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I, I think Valerie said it earlier also, and always use the full price and not the sale price. And that's what I always assume. I don't know how people shop. Maybe you're a great thrift shopper and you found it. I had this problem with my mom. She was a crazy thrift shopper. And so I would put a price on an item and she'd say, but I only bought it for $4 at a yard sale. And I was like, mom, if you had to buy that today, it would be $45. Like, you have right. to, you know, put the, okay, sorry, sorry. Um, put the, no <laughs> it's aggressive, <laughs> um, put the number in there for what you would have to go out and buy that item for today or, you know, whatever. Um, and so that is okay. okay. Shh, shh, shh. Um, and so that's, that's a great, that's a great suggestion is always use the higher price if you, wherever you find it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely use. Yes, exactly. The, yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. Selena, um, any other information, any other hints and tricks and, and suggestions you want to make? There's one that I've seen more than once is, you know how a lot of us women like purses and we have a lot of purses that falls under luggage in the in what you guys were talking about before it they put it into exact contents that's the program that these carriers use and then the adjuster is going to tell you once you send your list in okay i'm going to send this to the contents team well the contents team is made up of a bunch of people that all they do is data entry so when you're listing your items if you are too vague and <laughs> you may put um, something like, well, one I ran across the other day was he wanted and paid for his tires that he had removed off of the vehicle before the winter time. Well, the only way you're going to get those paid for without a denial letter from your auto policy is, you know what, maybe you had those tires, you used a rope and you hung them from the tree and that's what the kids or the grandkids played on. Maybe you use those tires to um, put some 
potting soil in and you were growing flowers in them. People do that. So, you know, this is, I'm not telling anybody to lie, but uh, what I am saying is sometimes you use those things. Yeah. You use those things for other, um, uh, other purposes. Right. Does and, that and make sense? Yeah. And cause it should reflect what you have and, and it's right. You know, my father-in-law got rid of his uh, dining room chair and he bought the, the super expensive, big and tall dining, you know, office chair. That is his kitchen chair. You know, it's not an 89, it's mm -hmm. not a, an $89 chair. It's a $600 chair. That is, you know, and it's what he has. So, you know, when you're pricing, be precise because you might be using things in a different context and that's okay, but you do, you know, you want to document as best you can what you had and, you know, sometimes they'll want to know where and, and when, and you can only provide what you have. Right. Right. I think mm -hmm. all of that is great. And I would just say as awful as it is sometimes is be your own advocate, spend the time to look over what they send you. If they had in there, you had a purse and it came up $35 and they didn't list that it was a Prada bag or a Michael Kors bag make those adjustments, make those comments, because I mean, as horrible as it sounds, you're the only one that really cares about your money. And they're not, you know, they're just trying to move it along, you know, to get it closed and taken care of. So be your own advocate, look at your lists, be specific when you can. And, you know, just, just really work. It's, it's a job <laughs> to, to get that stuff back to you. Right. And if you're not a person who, um, I'm just not a clothing person. So I, I mean, I know what a P code is now, but it never would have registered on my own without somebody educating me. So being aware of, uh, if you're not the person that tracks, you know, uh, things you inherited and, and, uh, you know, like China, if that's not your thing, find that family member or friend who understands that and knows what you had because they can tell you precisely what you had. Um, but sometimes you need that uh, personal subject matter expert to say, Oh, you're the, you're the queen of purses or you're the queen of cameras. Can you help me figure out what I had? Because I know we had it. I just don't know what it was. Right. And that knowing the details matters so greatly here. All right. Yes. And also if I can, Oh, sorry. Can I add one more thing, Val? Mm -hmm. So when people are, are people are making their list, you have to be very cognizant of quantity. So maybe instead of listing, mm, say, okay, one that I ran across was uh, he had some extra lumber, some four by fours and some two by fours and two by sixes that he was going to build a deck with in the future and it had been sitting there for a couple of years beside the house he never got it done but he was listing everything by the foot so you have your quantity was going to be like a thousand well i know state farm everybody has to these claims adjusters have to explain why the quantities are so high well instead of doing that let's list it by the board so now you're only going to have maybe 20 two by sixes instead of, of a thousand feet of all these pieces of lumber. Um, anything that you can cut down at books. Let's talk about books for just a minute because that's a big sticking point. There's several adjusters that's going to say, I need you to list out the, um, the types of books or one gal said, Hey, I need all the, um, the names of the books. No, you just, and you guys have a very, you have a great tool on your website um, for books and CDs, uh, VCR, uh, the um, DVDs, list them by genre and different ages. So don't say you had 300 vinyl LP albums. You want to break those down into five or six different genres and maybe by different ages. That way it's not a red flag to the carrier because they're going to mark that as high quantity, need more. Um, they want more description. They want more of a, they're going to want a breakdown. 
same thing like with a drawer don't say you know the junk drawer you had five hundred dollars worth of things in it that's not going to fly so you're going to have to break that down what was in that drawer unfortunately it's just it is a lot of work and we all we all know this and it's it, it's a daunting task but you'll be doing yourself a favor if you can be as detailed as possible when making your list. Well, actually, uh, throw out to both of you, Michelle raised an interesting point. Her, you know, it's the reverse of she she gave the detail. Um, and and the adjuster said, I will give you, you know, 20 pounds of clothing. And she had three closets. Um, so he just made up that number. How do you challenge something like that? I would just uh, I would just tell them that is that's not accurate. I would be closer to a hundred to a and a hundred to one hundred and fifty, or you know what? I would just say no, just flat out say no. Um, and that's what I tell people. If it's not right, they don't know. And and I don't mean that like you can lie and say because they don't know. I just mean like they don't know. They don't know what you had in your home. Every you could have had a three bedroom house with every closet filled with your clothes. I mean, there's no way for them to tell you what you did or didn't have. And so if it's wrong, tell them and fight it and say, no, that is not correct. That is not my number. This is my number. This is closer to my number. And if you think your number is 125, put 150 because I'm sure there's six jackets in the garage you forgot to add. There's all, you know, there's always something yes. you'll just never remember. My mom still does that. We'll walk through a store and she'll say, oh, I used to have a spatula just like that. And I'm like, your list is closed, mom. Like you're done. Like you'll never <laughs> like, let's move on from the uh -huh. spatula. <laughs> yeah, no, I, but I, I get that. Right. You know, that's the problem is it will be years. Um, Jane, are you able to put your question in the Q and A? I saw you had your hand raised. All right, Jane, you may unmute and ask your question since we are not able to get you any other way. All right, I don't think we can get her. All right, well, let me, I'm going to stop recording. I'm going to thank everyone for um, joining us today.